Welcome to Getting Better with Dr. Adam. Dr. Adam Silberstein is a clinical psychologist who has been working in the field since 1993. With a broad range of clinical experience, including state psychiatric hospitals, adolescent residential treatment with a trauma focus, the Department of Corrections, and in the addiction treatment arena. He is currently in private practice and is the clinical director and co-founder of Westside Treatment, a young adult dual diagnosis treatment facility in West LA. This podcast is for general information and entertainment purposes only. This should not be considered treatment advice, nor is it a substitute for an individual treatment plan. If you have questions or concerns about your individual situation, it is strongly recommended you consult a licensed professional to talk about things that are specific to you. If there's an emergency, it is strongly recommended you seek treatment at your nearest emergency room. I just spoke with Dr. Gary Fisher. He's a psychologist in Los Angeles. He has a vast amount of experience, um, 38 plus years working in all different settings. He's worked in Australia. He's worked in Hawaii. He's worked in Texas. He's worked in California. He's done virtually every job of a clinician working in um, dual diagnosis treatment and in addiction. But more importantly, what really um, struck me was his ability to integrate 12-step living or 12-step approach into his clinical practice. We actually went through how anybody, anybody with whether they're having a substance issue, which traditionally, you know, we send people to Alcoholics Anonymous as a very common recommendation, but how he can tackle any issue, um, be it anxiety, be it depression, and, you know, run it through the 12 steps to have a profound um, symptom reduction healing experience. So I hope you enjoy this. Hi, today I am honored to have Dr. Gary Fisher on Getting Better with Dr. Adam. That's me. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say before we start, um, I have, uh, this is really an honor for me because over the years in my practice, I have consulted with Dr. Gary Fisher countless times. He's been the guy who People of my age group and younger, um, many people I know have looked to you as the voice of wisdom, um, the voice of experience, and sound, uh, sound clinical, sound clinical thoughtfulness and approaches that um, really resonate with a lot of us. And I can speak for so many people, including myself, um, how uh, how inspired we are by your approach and your ideas. So thank you for being here. What an honor. Thank you, Adam. And um, what I thought would be interesting and what's always interested me uh, me about you is the use of 12 steps in in your treatment. And and I just I just want to give a little bit of background. I'm I'm talking to somebody who's been in the field approaching 40 years and uh, and just has has seen so much in terms of all facets of therapies and and treatment of addiction and treatment of of co-occurring issues from an administrative standpoint you've you've even worked in Australia you've worked in Texas right you've worked in California you've worked in Hawaii and it seems like you've sit in, sat in so many different seats from being a primary clinician in a, in facilities to being a supervisor to being an administrator to being a, in private practice like you are now to doing group therapy to doing EMDR eye movement desensitization reprocessing to you know to having experience with a whole array of of clientele um, and uh, you know, so it, it just really brings a lot to us into this discussion of of how you use twelve steps in practice. So I just I'm going to give a little bit of background in terms of how I view it, uh, how I was reared in professionally in terms of what it means to what the twelve steps mean. So when not, when when I sat for my licensing exam, the way we approached twelve steps, and you might have had the same experience, was oh. When somebody is an alcoholic, the correct answer is send them to Alcoholics Anonymous and they'll get what they need there. And that's pretty much it. Like, it's really good for alcoholics to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's really good for drug addicts to go to Narcotics Anonymous. It's really good. And 12 steps are really good. 
Yeah, we really, really encourage it, but it has nothing to do directly with the content of therapy. So what intrigued me and why I wanted to invite you here is you actually, from what I know, and you'll you'll talk about it, you actually believe that you know that it is an essential, it could be used as an essential ingredient of good therapy. And um, integrating 12 steps isn't just about addiction. It could be about a wide array of uh, life challenges or anything. So why don't you tell, how did you come up with that? Well, my uh, doctoral dissertation um, is uh, 12 steps, a theoretical and practical approach to counseling and psychotherapy. So... <clears throat> As I went through my doctoral program and, of course, my master's before that, I see that there's all these different schools of thought. There's humanistic, there's um, Freudian, there's... Uh, I can't even think of them right now. <laughs> I'll throw cognitive behavioral. Cognitive behavioral, uh, yeah. Interpersonal. Just behavioral... Um, uh, object relations. There's all this different kinds of approaches to psychology and psychotherapy. And when you break down the, the steps and, and for some reason I have this, the way my brain works is I see things and I see the similarities between them and I'm able to see where they can apply in all different kinds of situations. So as I was going through school doing that, I was also running a group. I was running a group of parents of young drug addicts. And I used them as the case study. Um, but essentially the 12 steps break down into cognitive, behavioral, and transpersonal psychology. So so I'm clear, you're in graduate school and, and I think your filter it seems is that I can filter things through the lens of 12 steps. And I can I can see I can synthesize the information and integrate information. It, it, you know, I'm not hearing someone who's saying, you know, you know, screw object relations. I don't want to hear about Freudian stuff. Twelve step all the way. What what I'm envisioning is is I'm imagining a student who was like, oh, that's like that. Oh, like oh, that reminds me of that. And that the principles that you were learning actually seem to be um, similar to what the twelve step approach was offering. Correct. And and I incorporate all of that stuff in my therapy. I'll do, I'll, I'll go to Freudian, I'll go to object relations, I'll go to whatever works, essentially. So I just want to explain for those who are listening, when you go to graduate school for to become a mental health provider, um, whether you're getting a master's degree or a doctoral degree or, or a medical degree, for that matter, in psychiatry, part of the training is is what approach, what theoretical approach are you going to use to conceptualize and treat people, right? So, so you're given a lot of information about different schools of thought that um, are effective in how to understand and reach someone and help them. So when we talk about, you know, what it, that experience is like, Dr. Fisher is talking about how he how he borrows from a variety of places, but can see, can consistently see stuff through the lens, see the information and see the effectiveness through the lens of 12 step. Correct. And 12 steps have been very effective. They're not, they're not effective for everyone, but, um, I also studied in my, uh, master's program under a transpersonal psychologist, a uh, very well-known guy in Hawaii. And, Transpersonal means to transcend the individual. So transpersonal therapy approaches are geared towards uh, psychic phenomenon, ESP, past life, but also spiritual issues such as God and what one's religious or spiritual beliefs are. So that was um, something I already connected with and related to. And I'm also... I lean towards cognitive behavioral <clears throat> in terms of if I had to have an approach other than the approach I use, it would probably lean towards cognitive behavioral. So 
studying with the transpersonal psychologist and studying transpersonal psychology and reading all these studies on the effects of meditation and um, all of this research that's been done in transpersonal psychology, it was it was an easy path to go from that into, well, why not just use the 12 steps, especially, as you were saying in the beginning, um, the previous the mentality was, okay, we'll send people with problems to these 12-step programs and let lay people, people out in the community, do do it with them. Well, what about the people who don't want to go to the 12-step meetings? Does that mean that they shouldn't get the benefit of what the structure of the 12 steps brings to people? And so I use 12 steps on, quote, normal people. I use 12 steps on people who have addiction problems and won't go to meetings or don't want to go to meetings or don't relate to meetings. It's almost as a, a precursor or not, right? Uh, as if you're not invested in the community, if you're not invested in that experience of going to a community of support, then we, then why, you know, what better experience than to have it with me who's familiar with it. And I just want to go back for a second. You were, you sounded like a practical hippie, <laughs> meaning like, like what I heard in that is, I believe in this transpersonal model. In other words, spirituality is not a taboo subject in your in your office. That 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 clients who come to see you have the bandwidth to talk about God and to talk about transcending in in and having a, a trans a transcendental experience um, in whatever spiritual um, modality that they're comfortable with, and that's encouraged. Correct. But even those who don't want to talk about spirituality per se as spirituality, you can talk about a set of principles as something to guide oneself. But I'm always working with people to get them to listen to their own intuitive voice, which to me is comes from their spirit or inner self, highest self. There's a lot of different labels for it, but that's what I mean by spirituality. One's own spirit and the connection of that that life force within us to all other life forces in the universe. So connectivity in that way, right? Guided by spirit, intuition, highest self, borrowed from transpersonal psychology, connected to what you called cognitive behavioral, which is a much more practical. So you're, there's a connected piece, and then there's a very practical approach to what structured steps could you take to access that connected space? Correct. So people come in and of all varieties and you want to open up this great experience that lay people are offering. You want to open up this experience to, you don't just need to be an alcoholic to have that experience. Anybody could have that experience and there's benefit. So what are the range of, in a, besides the clientele who are struggling with a substance or some sort of out of control, you know, drug, alcohol, food, who are, who's a good candidate for for having a 12-step experience with you as, as, as a client? Anyone, basically. Okay. Um, so it, it, first, let me just uh, mention that when I look at addiction, and of course in the 1950s, alcoholism was uh, accepted by the American Medical Association mm -hmm. as a disease, and later on, drug addiction followed in that path. I see it as a dis-ease, a D-I-S-E-A-S-E. So it is a dis-ease within oneself, a disconnection from one's authentic self, that spirit, that core self, that creates an ego state uh, of separation. And when you listen to people in 12-step programs, almost without exception, they'll talk about not feeling a part of, feeling different, feeling alienated, feeling inadequate, all of which is a result of being disconnected from oneself. So that can apply to anybody. I have people with anxiety issues, with depression issues, with uh, relationship issues, with you name it issues. And from my perspective, as I was saying earlier, my ability to see the similarity 
I see the similarity between them and an addict whose coping mechanism is some sort of addictive behavior, whereas the ang anxious person, their coping mechanism is to just feel anxious all the time. Both people are disconnected from their authentic self. And so the approach with both of them is to learn how to get connected, to not be afraid of one's own feelings. I've worked with somebody, somebody comes to mind, uh, I've worked with for about almost 10 years, uh, who came in after getting fired off of a job as an editor and supposedly had anger issues. And we began our therapy together and began working the steps. And com he completely transformed his life as a result of that. And he didn't have any real addictive problems. So help me understand. So other people who I'm, I'm a person listening to this. I have no, this is my first time ever hearing about this 12 step talk, right? It's my first time hearing about your, you know, Dr. Gary Fisher is talking about my connected, intuitive, higher self, right? And, and implying that if I'm connected, I'm not going to pursue substance. I'm not going to pursue my thought life won't be as chaotic if I'm connected in a connected state versus an ego state. Can you expand on that? What is What are you referring to? What does it mean to be in a connected state? And what does it mean to be in a disconnected or a diseased? I like that, not disease for those listening, but disease. What do you mean? How does that, how does that, what are the mechanics of that? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by the mechanics, but... What does it look like? It looks like... Because <clears throat> um, the implication is if I'm connected, I'm not going to... I'm not going to, if I'm a warrior, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm anxious in social situations and I'm panicked about how I'm going to be received and, and what did they think of me and all, you know, and, and let's just say that's the issue. I'm, you know, you know, how am I going to be received in, at, at school? I don't know. You know, this one may be judging me. I saw the way they look and my head is spinning in that. Right. Right. And, right. and versus you're saying that in a, that's a disconnected, diseased state. Right, we're not talking about substances versus connected. What does connected look like, and what does disconnected look like? So connected looks like that. I have a connection to who I am. I know who I am. I'm comfortable with who I am. I'm not perfect. I'm not the best looking guy in the world. I'm not horribly ugly. I'm not the greatest at anything. I'm not the worst at anything. It, you know, humility. The definition of humility is an accurate appraisal of oneself, strengths and weaknesses and where they fit in in the world. So if I have an accurate appraisal of myself, I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not good at. I don't need to brag about it, but I don't need to put myself down about the things I'm not good at. So there's a general peace, there's a sense of, of peacefulness, of calm, of um, just being at ease instead of diseased. So there's a sense of ease. And I'm not talking about that I go through life ohm and, and nothing bothers me. If you cut me off in traffic and it scares me, I'm going to have a reaction like anybody else is going to have. I'm probably not going to flip anybody off. I'm not going to chase them down and get into a road rage incident. If I do that to somebody else, which has happened to me, and somebody got really angry at me and I rolled down my window, and I said, I'm so sorry. And they said, okay, have a great day. How disarming. You know, so right. it's, it's just an approach to life. Um, some, some, uh, one of the people I see, I see some clinicians and in my practice, and one of them brought a, a, a person that they were starting to see who suffers from body dysmorphic disorder and spends eight plus hours a day worrying about going bald and, for those of you, this is audio only. I have no hair on my head, so not anytime me, soon. You won't, and you won't anytime soon. And I won't anytime ever. But the fact is, is this is somebody who's diseased. They're disconnected. They're they're in a an obsessive state, an ego state that's disconnected from their authentic self. Their authentic self just wouldn't worry about losing their hair. So, on, what I'm hearing between the lines is behind the storm of the obsession or the chaos of thought or the chaos of self-judgment or other judgment 
in that sea of of head thinking, behind that is 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 you believe in everybody a place of peace. Underneath that, yeah. yes. Underneath that, and that in that place of peace, my I'm not going to be preoccupied. My pace of peace can accept and be comfortable with my baldness. Correct. Or, it could, or go get something done about it if there's really an issue about it. But it's not an internal war. No, and it's not something that I'm going to spend eight to ten hours of my day, seven days a week, worrying about. Now, do I have concern for people that I care about? Of course. Do I have some of my own concerns? Of course. We're not talking about perfection. But I think of two studies that um, one of them is an individual uh, report uh, by a transpersonal psychologist. And the other study was a study done on uh, heroin addicts on methadone. And, you know, double-blind studies are where people, um, well, you have an experimental group which does something different and then you have the control group which does nothing different. And they were both on, uh, both groups were on methadone. And one group, the only difference in the experimental group was they were taught transcendental meditation. And they committed to doing that meditation. So for an experiment to be statistically significant, there has to be a change in the experimental group that is greater than chance would allow. So the experimental group of people who just learns transcendental meditation, their intake of methadone either stayed the same or reduced or even was eliminated just by meditating daily, even on a strong opiate like methadone. The control group, which didn't do anything, just stayed on the methadone, either stayed at the same or went up in their dosage. Therefore, what you saw was that just simply connecting with oneself through consistent meditation was enough to reduce the desire to numb oneself with with opiates. Uh, The other one was just a gentleman who was a social drinker and started meditating. And he wrote about his experience that the more he meditated, the less he wanted to drink because, and he was just a normal drinker. He just found that being under the influence of alcohol compared to being connected to himself through meditation, the alcohol was distasteful. It no longer was as pleasant. It wasn't that he stopped drinking completely. He just reduced his alcohol intake. And that's what I've seen. That's what I've heard. That's what I've experienced. People who connect to themselves authentically, usually through meditation and also through what I call processing, which means grieving and getting out the original pain that caused the disconnection. There's no desire to numb oneself or to alter one's consciousness on that level. And even if they do, It's just an occasional, yeah, I don't mind having an occasional. Mm -hmm. It doesn't create an addictive behavior. So the more connected I am, the less likely I'm going to pursue things in an increasing way that hurt me. So I want to walk through this with a non-substance case. Okay. So just walk us through an example of, you were talking earlier about somebody with anger, somebody with body dysmorphia. How would someone, how would these... How would this apply and how would you use it and what principles, you know, sort of in a, and I know it's hard to do in a quick amount of time, but guide us through the process of what we're talking about, of connecting to self, grieving, you know, accessing pain, healing pain, and, and you know, coming out on the other side. What does it look like? Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think about uh, somebody I, I, I've seen for quite a while uh, and Uh, A woman um, married, raised three kids. Uh, She was part of the parent group that I worked with and started seeing me individually. And some things came up from her childhood that were very, very painful for her. And she struggled with accepting that they actually happened, you know, hating the fact that she was talking about it 
Um, and it, it just created so much anxiety for her. And she suffered from fibromyalgia. And fibromyalgia is a very painful um, disease in, in creating these bundles of nerves and muscles that are just very, very painful. And as, doctor's nightmare. They're yeah, like, I don't know what to do. Cause they don't, they don't know what causes it. They can't really do much about it. But we started, you know, identifying that this created a dis-ease for her, whatever the occurrence was in her childhood. I'm not going to go into details and her disconnection and the pain of the, the psychic pain of that, I believe also manifested in physical pain for her. So we worked the 12 steps. So let's start. I'm powerless over. That's the first step. We admitted we were powerless over. Powerless over this incident that happened and my, what came out of that incident in terms of how I interpreted that about me, about other people has made aspects of my life unmanageable. That's the first step powerless over X, my life has become unmanageable as a result of my trying to control what I'm powerless over. I'm powerless over an event, not a substance, right? Right. Powerless over this event that happened to me. I wish I had power over it, but I don't. I admit that. And because I want, because of my powerlessness over this event, it's causing me unmanageability, distress, whatever you want. Because I internalize shame. I hate myself for this, I blame myself for this, whatever the case might be. All aspects in back to the original point of disconnected. Disconnected. So second step is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So what would sanity be? So one of, one of the uh, things that I work, uh, not in this particular case, but for a lot of people who don't have addictive disorders, I'll work a set of steps on being powerless over fear controlling their lives. These are people who are fear-based. All decisions are based out of what they're less afraid of or more afraid of. And that fear running their life makes their life unmanageable because usually whatever it is we're afraid of, if we act out of that fear, we create what we fear. So these are people who keep creating their worst fears and it, it makes them more and more afraid. So a restoration to sanity in that case is what would life look like if it wasn't run on fear? So I take the original symptom that I'm powerless over, the thing that I feel like I just can't control it. I keep, keep coming from fear. I keep thinking about this event, that this life-changing event that I didn't want to happen. What would sanity look like? Correct. And you help them, right? And you help To identify them. what that is. What the vision of wellness would look like. Right. Right? Not coming from that place. But usually I don't have to help them. That's, that's the idea. The, the truth of it is lies within them always. So I just ask them to do some writing. What would you look like? What would you feel like? And what would your life look like? Let's say if we're working on fear, if you weren't afraid. Okay. So that vision is... And they'll, they'll do some writing and they'll usually identify pretty clearly what they would feel like, what their life would look like if they weren't fear-based. I don't have to tell them. They come up with it themselves. Correct. Try different... I may I'm ask willing, someone I'm, out. I'm willing to take a risk, most, first and foremost. Right. Instead of playing it safe. So that's step one and step two. What is step three? Step three is made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So if somebody is not a believer, and this woman that I was originally talking about with the fibromyalgia, she is a Christian and she very much believes in it. So that was not an issue for her. But for people who have an issue with the, the word God, we can work with that. I'll have them do some writing on what their concept of a higher power might be what the concept of a universal life force, whatever it is. And um, making a decision to turn one's will and one's life, I equate that with turning one's wants and needs 
over to the care of something. And I break that down for them very clearly. And one of the ways that that plays out is my needs come first, your needs come second, and wants are negotiated. All things being equal. Well, if we're talking about children, it doesn't work quite that way. Right. But ultimately, if I don't take care of my needs, which is why the airlines always tell you to put on your mask first, before you help somebody else with the oxygen, because if I'm passed out, I can be of no help to anybody. So my needs come first, your needs in a relationship with me come second, and wants are negotiated. Addiction, and I'm back to addiction, because that's my specialty, is my wants come above everything. Codependency is your wants come above everything. Right, and if I put my wants my, if I put my wants ahead of my needs, it's going to be a disaster. Anytime wants supersede needs, illness follows, whether it's mental illness, physical illness, emotional illness, always. Wants can never supersede needs in, in healthy state. So take me back to the context of this step, which is about turning over, right? Turning over to care of um, God, as we understand him, or some sort of power. What is it? So we're talking about needs. We're talking about wants. You're educating people, um, differentiating wants versus needs. Correct. And how to prioritize. Put my needs first, my wants second, right? Right. What does it look like? Is, what is this concept of turning over to the, to the lay person, to an anxious person, to the person who's dealing with the childhood issue? Um, what does it look like to turn over wants and needs? Okay, well... Um we turn over things on a daily basis. We turn over our cars to mechanics. We turn over our teeth to dentists. We turn over our taxes to tax people. We turn stuff over to the care of other people all the time. So I just frame it in terms of practicality. What I'm doing is I'm not focusing on what I want and what I need. I'm focusing on what do I do? What's in front of me? If I have a job, I go to the job. If I have a, a family, I take care of the family. If I have bills, I pay the bills. That's in all practicality what it means. And I don't worry about the results of that because my focus is to move into step four. So essentially what I'm saying by turning things over is I'm turning over the result of what I do. I'm turning over the fact that I have goals, but I'm not focused on, oh, I got to accomplish my goal or I got to worry about paying my bills. No, if I show up for work every day, like I'm, you know, uh, responsible to do, I'll make the money I make and I'll pay the bills as best as I can. So that's essentially what it means. It means setting the right priorities, showing up for whatever it is I'm responsible for each day in each moment. But the focus is to move into step four. So step three in that light from, an, from a clinical standpoint is about is a control anxiety issue. I trust the process. I have to have trust in some process. I'm going to decide to trust the I'm process. I'm going to decide to trust the process. And then I'm ready once I'm not busy trying to control. I'm ready to move into a different examination, which comes in step four. Which is how did I get from where I started as a newborn to this place that I'm in therapy and needing to do these 12 steps. How did that occur? So that's a huge unpacking, right, of what happened. Right. So I have people, uh, it's uh, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves is step four. I just have people write their life story. And as soon as I say that, everybody freaks out. Oh my God, that's going to be so long. And it, it doesn't take that long in most cases. Uh, one guy I had took, I think, about eight years to get it done. But that's a little, that's not the norm. So that's not the norm. for those listening, eight years, uh, you're going to run away. It's not an eight year process. No. So you write your life story. You write your life story, all the significant events, people, relationships, what didn't happen that you wished had happened, all that stuff, and just lay it out there. Step five is. Ad admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So essentially they read the inventory to me. And my job as the person receiving this inventory is to hear and 
and conceptualize the patterns that have developed for this person. So you hear the narrative. <clears throat> I hear the narrative. And as a clinician, right, not as a lay person, you identify themes and patterns. And patterns. Through the, through the written story. Correct. This through your through my perception of my story that I'm you're bearing witness to, right? Correct. I'm gonna, you're going to start to identify patterns and themes, and then and then what happens? Well, uh, in that process, also I'm validating their experience mm-hmm. because we talk about how painful these uh, situations were for them and where that original wound to self came that created the separation and that they did the best they could to cope with that, that that disconnection was a life-saving, insanity-saving decision, not one that they were conscious of making, because a lot of times it happens in such a young age that they're not even consciously aware of it. Um, So they read that, we conceptualize the, the patterns, the issues, and move into step six. Before we go there, there sounds like a real, um, the experience of reading that is not just I read it and yawn. You're not, it's a real powerful, um, you know, it's a real powerful exploration of what the originals, what some, what some of the original disconnects were. And you as a therapist, um, and not as a sponsor, this is different than being a sponsor. Maybe you want to speak to that. You're not a sponsor in that way. Right, a sponsor is the person who guides the, the lay person who guides somebody through the twelve steps. It sounds like it can be a very powerful emotional experience, where somebody is really identifying past pain and wounds, and is sharing with you, and you're providing a space of validation and of interpretation to use more of a clinical word that helps them to understand what their part is, how how actually the symptoms serve them. I mean, it's 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 it sounds very therapy like too. It is, and um, the other thing about that process is we might have gotten to most all of that information in 10 to 15, 20 years of therapy, but we get to get to it a lot sooner. That doesn't mean the healing goes that much faster, but it certainly gives me as the therapist a lot of background information to use to help this person in therapy without having to go through it an hour at a time, week by week by week. So as a therapist tool, right, is what I'm hearing, it's different than a sponsor walking somebody through the steps. Correct. In that way, you're thinking of it clinically in a broader way of how am I going to help this person in the long run? And it's just an informational, it's almost like a, a, a history. It is a history. That That's why I have them write their life history. And the difference, the, the Probably the main difference between a sponsor and a therapist is I am a a licensed professional to work with these kinds of issues. So it isn't just me revealing my identification and, and relatedness to the person reading it to me like a sponsor might do. It's with some degree of authority in having studied all of this stuff giving them a, a, conce- a conceptual way of looking at their experience that validates them as human beings, that, you know, uh, affirms their, their, their goodness, their innate um, worth. Right, and it's, that, that is a therapist's job. It's the bread and butter, validation, empathy, right, insight, the things that we offer, which may be different than a sponsor experience. Correct. Also, a, a certain type of protection of information. There are different factors and in, in understanding of diagnostics and treatment needs that you bring to the table there. Mm-hmm. So what is step six? So step six is um, we, uh, what is step six? We're entirely ready. <laughs> We're entirely ready. <laughs> yes, to have. <laughs> to have God remove all these defects of character. So Step five is we admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six implies that the exact nature of our wrongs are what are called character defects because it says we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. So that must imply that the exact nature of my wrongs are defects of character. And what is meant by defects of character? 
It's character traits that are just out of proportion. It's not that they're that I'm defective. That's not what it means. It means that I've developed these coping mechanisms, defense mechanisms, character traits, and say one of them is anger. I'm not just angry. I'm angry all the time. While other people might idle at about 1,000 RPMs, I idle at 5,000 RPMs. So for me to go into rage doesn't take much because I'm always idling at anger. Out of proportion coping strategies, right? Our defects of character. Our defects of character. And I'm going to just go back to the, you know, somebody has a childhood burden, doesn't want it to be there. I wish this didn't happen to me. It's making my life unmanageable. I think about it all the time. I revisit it. I'm angry it happened. I un- I go- or, or let me just interrupt, or I deny that it happened and therefore I deny its effect on me and I have a blind spot that I'm still reacting out of that I will not look at. So I, I, I see the unmanageability. I see how it's affecting me. I see that what I identify sanity. I identify the trust in the process in step three and let's go through this and let go of the results. I start to write the right story. Inst- I start to write the story out it, uh, the, my therapist bears witness entirely, right? Validates and 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 helps me in, to understand the story and and how it served me at a certain point and now how it doesn't. Step six, I I start to identify patterns in that story. I've started to, or these character defects or out of proportion coping mechanisms. So I put them. I I, I start to realize. Oh my gosh! I, for example, I I minimize, right? In that case. I've gone through this event. I, I tend to deny it, right? And how? And I tend to be somebody who doesn't want to look at the full range of information. So I'm a minimizer. And what would be some examples of character characteristics that come up that need work? Anger, selfishness, self-centeredness, um, jealousy, uh, low self-esteem, uh, fear. Those types of things. Just human stuff. Human aspects and ways that we try to cope with life right we're not anti-fear we're just saying in this case hey maybe your fear is out of proportion yes fear is a necessary part of life um it can save my life as a matter of fact but if fear runs everything then that's a defect of character and therefore that has to change if i'm going to live fully and enjoy my life i was talking to somebody yesterday who obsessively lives in their disconnected ego state and therefore whatever they accomplish they cannot internalize so they never change their opinion of themselves because they're not able to internalize any of the positive things they do there's a block to that so part of step six is identifying those characteristics which which lend to the blocks correct so step seven Step seven is I humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Bill Wilson, who wrote the 12 steps, said that he chose shortcomings versus character defects because he didn't want to be redundant. However, I believe that they're different. In fact, I believe they're the complete opposite. A shortcoming is what I come up short of. A defect of character is what I have too much of. So they're not the same. Hmm. They're the opposite. So in identifying the shortcoming, say for anger, the shortcoming is forgiveness. Because if I've developed these coping mechanisms and these strategies for survival, for for me to ask whatever my higher self or the universe or God to take away that, that's going to be very difficult. I'm asking for my character to be shrunk, Mm -hmm. to be smaller. Whereas if I'm asking for for to learn about forgiveness, which to me is the uh, shortcoming of anger, then I'm asking the universe or my higher self or God to give me more forgiveness or help me to understand and have more forgiveness. I'm asking for my character to be built. And if forgiveness begins to expand and outweigh and outsize the anger, the anger shrieks, shrinks in comparison and it's no longer a character defect. So 
for those listening who have no 12 step experience, I'm identifying my struggles. I have, I could be a person with excess fear. What would it look like? What do, what's the shortcoming? What is the, what would I need to grow more of to, to, um, address and to, and to have an experience of healing, right? What would be the, what would be that for fear? Fear would be courage. Right. I'm so afraid of risk. Have help me grow in courage. Help me to be more courageous in my choices, not be less afraid. I can't, it's very difficult to be less afraid or less angry when I'm angry and afraid. Mm -hmm. What it is possible is to try to be more courageous and more forgiving. So then I focus for the next month on those shortcomings or assets that I need to have more of. That's what I focus on. I don't focus on the defects. I focus on the assets. If I'm in the praying place, if I pray, and if I pray to whatever it is I believe in, I ask for each of these things in the list that we've made, and I ask to have more of them and to grow in them. And as I'm saying the word, I encourage people to really visualize and imagine what that would feel like to bring creative visualization into the mix so that I can begin to see myself as that person. So in, in the language of, of psychology, strength building, resourcing, right? Using mindfulness and vision and contemplation to envision what, who I want to be if I embrace these assets. What would Correct. it look like not to, to, to um, punitively self-reflect on how I'm deficient? No. Not at all, but instead, what would I look like with the building of these assets? And, and just in practical terms, it is far easier to move towards something than to back away from something. So instead of backing away from who I've been and how I've lived my life, I'm turning around right in the middle of six and seven, which is halfway through the steps, I'm turning towards who I want to be. Why do you think that it's just out of curiosity, it's easier to move towards something than to back away from something? Well, it just is uh, uh, mechanically. Uh, if you mean you're, literally, the metaphor literally, physically? Physically, if you're carrying a big heavy object, would you rather be in the back moving forward or in the front moving backwards? I hear you. I hear you. That makes sense. So we are finished with more than half the steps. We're on step eight. Step eight has made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. So we're not in the space of character defects now. We're in personal relationships. We're in personal relationships. Uh, the goal of the steps, it says very clearly in the literature, is to have the best possible relationship with all human beings. That can go anywhere from being very, very close to not speaking to that person at all because that may be the best possible relationship. So I list the people that I've harmed or institutions that I've harmed because it's more than just people. And I become willing to make amends to them all. So first we look at what's the difference between hurt and harm. Harm contains intent. I can do something that's really right for me and somebody I care about will be hurt and upset with me because it isn't what they want me to do. That's not harm. I don't make amends for that. Harm is lying, cheating, stealing, um, those types of things, raging, threatening, intimidating, you know, manipulating. These are harmful behaviors because there is an intent in them to deceive, to hurt, to get what I want at whatever expense to you. So those are the things that I'm going to make amends for. And amends is more than an apology. An apology is just an apology. An amend is a change. So at this point in time, I'm looking that I'm becoming willing to change because I've just spent 30 days focused on these assets and, and I'm trying to become the person I really want to be. So the person who's dealing with the, this terrible thing happened to me is examined at this point how 
the impact of that experience, ha- you know, has had on that person. Correct. And what their char- what character issues that that are out of proportion, what they want to grow towards. And now you're asking them to take responsibility for the way they've behaved toward in life in general. Yes, but let's be clear: this person was abused in some way, shape, or form by an adult. They're not taking responsibility for that. And they're not going back to that person and making amends for that. Right. The person that in that instance that they're going to usually make amends to is to themselves because of what they did with that experience to themselves. So these, the amends could also could be towards oneself, how I harm myself. Yes. In many cases, in all cases, eventually in all cases, one will look at that. How have I harmed myself? But, Initially, it's about how have I harmed other people? So if something happened in childhood, which is usually where it happens, I'm not necessarily responsible for what happened, but I'm responsible for what I did with it and later on how I maybe acted in a similar way or took my anger out on people who didn't harm me that way, and I harmed them as a result of that. So you're looking at that, and you're willing to change. And that may that means that you're going to approach, it may involve approaching people and saying, and owning it. And owning it, yes. And there's going to be, and, and there's a lot of controversy about this in many, many circles, and everybody should do whatever they feel is best. But in the list making, as, as we look at becoming willing to make amends, we look at there's there's three categories or four categories. There's people that I've harmed that I'll make amends to. There's people that have harmed me that I'm going to work on forgiveness towards. And not because I'm letting them off the hook, I'm letting me off the hook. Hmm. Because as long as I hold a resentment towards them, I am connected to that individual in a negative contract. And if this is somebody who's really harmed me, why would I want to be connected to them at all? Mm. So I work on making amends, forgiveness. There are some people who will meet both of those. I've harmed them. They've harmed me. And then there's the fourth type is I don't owe them anything. They don't owe me anything. They happen to be mentioned in my inventory because they were part of my life history, and we just cross them off. So there are people clearly I have to clean up the mess I made and how I harmed them. There are people who harm me who I have to let go of the burden of the story. I don't have to, but it would help me to let go. It of would it. give me freedom. That's and, right. And moving towards that connected self. And then there are people who it's two-way street. And then there are things that I actually don't have to clean up. Correct. There's nothing to clean up. So they go through that experience. There's a healing in relationship. I can face people and institutions and myself, hopefully, right, in a different light. What is step 10? No, you skipped nine. Oh, I I thought we were on nine. I thought we just did nine. No, we were talking about eight. Maybe become willing. Become willing. And nine is we actually made direct amends to such people, except when to do so would injure them or others. So this is where we actively seek out people to make amends to them. Sometimes there's people we don't know. There are anonymous people we interacted with in our lives. So there are ways to do that. Sometimes people are dead. How do I make an amends to a dead person? There are ways to do that. There's letter writing and burning into the ether. There's visiting grave sites. There's just doing general amends, burning into the ether. So there's a lot of different ways that one can complete step nine. This is, so you're talking about the actual action of step eight, approaching the individual, here or not, anonymous or known, how do you approach them? How do you approach, how do you not approach them sometimes if it's not appropriate? And you discern with them what you're going to do with that step eight list. Correct. Of the list of people you have harmed. And what we do is step nine. To do that is step nine. Yes. So step 10. Step 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admitted it. So here I've, I've, started a practice of looking at myself, taking personal responsibility for my side of the street in all situations, even if that side is 2%. So it's a practical application of what I've learned. Correct. 
I've and a learned, continuation right, of that. Right, a practical maintenance. It's that I'm somebody who uses this formula in the way I, I look at my sense of powerlessness at times. I look at my part in things. I look at the story. I examine what my assets needed to grow to deal with my character defects are. And if I need to, I'll make an amends. Yes, and at the end of that, because it says that our lives have become unmanageable, that we turn our will and life over to the care of God as we understood him. At the end of that process, my life becomes manageable because I now know how to manage it. I put my needs first, your needs second, and we negotiate wants. I clean up old messes so that I have the best possible relationship. And this will in life that I turned over to the care of God is turned back over to me because my will is aligned with the will of the universe now, meaning I'm living a healthy life based on principles that go along with mental and emotional health, and I manage my own life. Uh, I don't participate necessarily in things that I am powerless over because I understand I'm powerless and I don't expend my time and energy on things that I can't do anything about. So I'm that person who had the childhood burden. I've gone through this process. I suspended my right to manage for a little bit, <laughs> right? I turned it over. And now I'm saying, you know what? I actually have the formula, the tools, right, to manage, right, based on principles, I've embraced these principles. I get that if I revisit that, why would I do it? It's, it's, it's not going to, that power, if I go there in that, that loop of thought, right, or that investment in, I can't believe this happened, I know the result of that because I've had an experience. Right. Now, that may not happen right after step nine, but as we get through 10, 11, and 12, eventually that's, that's what happens. But I also want to say, this is a practical working of the steps. There's an emotional working of the steps that takes a lot longer. And it is that that heals. And if I don't do that, then all that practical stuff will be um, lost because <clears throat> the belief systems that we form as children about ourselves, about life, about our place in the universe, if we consider that a balloon, our belief systems are the balloon, the emotions that those decisions were made with and those belief systems were formed with are the big steel washers that they put on the end of the balloon string that holds the balloon down. Those emotions anchor our belief systems. So I can cognitively understand this belief system and find that it's not the healthy belief system and I should change it. It's a distortion of myself, blah, blah, blah. But if I hang on to the wound, the emotional wound, and I don't grieve that woundedness, those belief systems will not go away. And they will bring me slowly back into the same place I was when this whole process started. So the woman that I was dealing with fibro, who had fibromyalgia, as she got into the grief of these things and started grieving them and crying and sobbing and going through that, lo and behold, her fibromyalgia became less and less. And actually for a time, she didn't suffer any of the symptoms of it. Grieving. So it's not just for people it's not just unique to I was, I was uh, abused. The anxious person is going to need to have a grieving process too. Yes, whatever it was that created their disconnection and the anxiety. So, what is, what is, so how do you define grieving in this context? What does it look like? looks like crying. Okay, so that's simple. <laughs> so, so, that's simple. That's <laughs> simple. That's simple. So to those listening, right, Dr. Fisher believes that you're going to, to have a long and impactful experience that's not just cursory cognitive, you're going to need to cry at some point. A lot, probably. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. They've done studies of the chemistry of different types of tears. And different types of tears have different chemistry. 
There also was a movie many years ago, What the Bleep Do We Know? I don't know if, yeah, uh, if anybody in the audience has seen that. There was a, I think it was a Japanese um, scientist who did some experiments with uh, jars of water and looking at the molecules of water when somebody would be screaming at them and they'd be playing really horrific music, discordant music, or when they would talk soothingly to the water. And you could see this change in the molecular structure of the water when negative stuff was aimed at it uh, versus positive stuff. And we as human beings are 98% water. So imagine what all that negative thought, internal thought, all that self-condemnation, all that negative self-talk does to us. So the grief is really part of letting go of all of that so that I could actually have some semblance of compassion for myself. Not let myself off the hook for things I'm responsible for, but have compassion for the fact that things happened to me that were beyond my control. I made decisions out of that. I want to change those decisions. I make mistakes. Okay. But I'm a decent human being. And the access point that I'm hearing is about accessing tears. Because underneath the tears is my core self. And if I'm unwilling to go through the tears, I can't access that highest part of me, that spirit part of me. I'm still separated from it. So it is, it is the process of releasing all of that pain as it was originally felt and created that frees my spirit up to become the source of what I live out of. How do we didn't touch on step 11 and 12 yet? Okay. So how does that facilitate if the, you know, um, this process? Well, step 11 is sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as we understood him asking only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So here the step talks about practicing, meditation and prayer to connect, to build on this relationship with my spirit, my internal self. And if I believe in a God, then I, then I'm, I'm building a relationship with that God as well. In that, um, step 11 prayer and meditation, as I connect more, is there a chance in your experience that people will start the emotional process of, um, also crying and, and connecting? Well, uh, hopefully, but most meditation practices are designed to be focused on something, whether it's breath or a flame or a mantra. And whenever you move away from that thing that you're focused on, you gently bring yourself back. The meditation that I practice and, and try to teach is a meditation that allows you to simply go with whatever comes up, including a lot of feelings, and to process those feelings out, to have them come up and, and go away. Dysfunctional, unhealthy behavior is all feeling avoidant behavior, all of it. It's all about avoiding feelings. You get a lot of emotion as a result of all that dysfunctional behavior, but that emotion is a distraction from the core feelings that one needs to feel. So there's the necessary pain of life and then there's the unnecessary pain of life. So if I'm an obsessor and I'm in that space of worry, you know, what the people are going to think of me, there's a form in this, in your perspective, that's a form of feeling um, that's, you're not feeling the necessary feeling. No, you're creating unnecessary pain with your anxiety and worry about what other people think to avoid the necessary pain that you're carrying around inside you. Those wounds that you Those were talking wounds. about. So if I get to the necessary pain and I grieve it, my mind is at rest. I'm connected to my inner self and I'm not obsessing about what other people think and I'm not creating unnecessary pain. There's enough necessary pain in life. Uh -huh. We don't need to go seeking out unnecessary pain. But step 11 is part of that process. And step 12. Step 12 is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to other people and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Okay. So that's just 
we we try to let people know if they're interested and they'll they'll notice a difference in us and ask us what happened and that's where we get to change to tell them what the process was and pay it forward pay it forward which also helps also helps so this isn't a five minute process somebody walks through this and you invite invite people who to this experience in your in in practice who's not a good candidate for this the only people who aren't good candidates for this are people who don't really want to do different than they're doing or don't think they have a problem. They don't need help. They're fine. Why would they see you? They wouldn't. Right. <laughs> but in your office. But, but sometimes people are forced to come. Oh, my my wife, my husband, my mom, my uh, dad, my boss said I needed to do this. But I don't really need any. I don't. I'm fine. Right. It's really for people who who, who acknowledge that they want help. Yes. And, and, and in that space, it's open to anybody who wants help. It is. But even people who want help want practical help. They don't necessarily want to go through a process that could take years of, of grieving. They want a quick solution. Okay, well, stop doing what you're doing and you'll get better. <laughs> not Right, not that simple. So I, I want to go back to one thing. You were saying earlier that you had originally your, your dissertation was based on a parent group you were doing. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 can you tell us a little bit more about that group? Uh, it was just a bunch of parents of kids that were uh, addicted. And you used, did you use this process with those, that, the group members? Yes, I did. And then what was, what was the result? You just, and, and you wrote about that experience? Yes, that was part of the dissertation was uh, anonymously without identifying information, of course just my experience running the group and how what I had written in the dissertation applied to the people, the different personalities in the group. Interesting. I, and I, I, I want to conclude with this. It's, it's, to me, there's some taboo. I once met with a pretty academic psychologist who really insisted that her work in addiction treatment was, I'm not a sponsor. And everything was packaged in a it was almost wrong to reference 12 step and um, n- not that the person was anti 12 step, but it was a considered a, a, a sort of a, an, an, a soft therapy, a, it's not what professionals do. And as we walk through step one through 12 with you on any issue, we're like, we, we can really plug anything in. I, 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 as a psychologist, I see, you know, I'm just sort of hearing, I'm hearing history, I'm hearing empathy, I'm hearing reflective listening, I'm hearing um, processing emotions and pain, I'm hearing increased insight, I'm hearing interpretations, I'm hearing so many things. I'm hearing mindfulness, big buzzword, right? I'm hearing mindfulness, I'm hearing vision, I'm hearing goals. I just hear so much about what we do. Why not use this as an anchor, as a guide to what we do already to help structure our process because it has good principles. I do. Yes. <laughs> so I But but also there's a word that that you didn't mention which is empowerment. I'm empowering people to eventually not need me. Which is really the the ultimate goal of all um therapy and for that matter for all parenthood. Right. So but, but that's really what this is about. This isn't about that you should develop a dependence on me and I have to guide you through the steps for the rest of your life. This is about you connecting with that inner guide in you and listening to that. Right, and which will, which will in essence, right, if I'm an insurance company, even though, unfortunately, you've used words like, de- like a decade, you know, you, you know <laughs> it's the person I've been seeing for 10 years, I don't know if they'd go for it, but what you're ultimately arriving at is an experience of, of what you said, manageability. I actually don't operate from a place of symptom. It's symptom reduction. Correct. Right. I operate from a place of empowerment, right. And newfound tools. Right. But if I see somebody even in their twenties, who's been doing this for 15 years of that 20 years, they're not going to get better in, you know, 12 visits. So no, I don't, I think that would be unrealistic in this model. And especially with the, the type of people who come to see us, um, 
And I, I, I just, I want to remind everybody, this, this, the theme of this is getting better. And this was a really, really good illustration of walking through a process, um, both emotionally and cognitively, of how someone um, actually gets better, literally gets better. Right. Different experience. So thank you so much. It's been, a, it's been such a pleasure talking to you and, and walking through that. My pleasure. Thank you Thanks, for coming. Adam. All right. This podcast is for general information and entertainment purposes only. This should not be considered treatment advice, nor is it a substitute for an individual treatment plan. If you have questions or concerns about your individual situation, it is strongly recommended you consult a licensed professional to talk about things that are specific to you. If there is an emergency, it is strongly recommended you seek treatment at your nearest emergency room.